today I'm going to be covering how to paint lips in three-quarter view. It's a lot more difficult than you guys think because you guys think that you can just draw front view lips and then squish them and then that's it. That's three-quarter view lips. Nope. There's a lot more substructure under that. There's a lot more form under that. But before I get started, if you've ever seen me critique people's art, you know that I critique art through my subreddit. So to get to my subreddit and to see your work in my videos, all I have to do is go to istabrak.com and click on the subreddit icon right here. Drawing lips in three quarter view. Where do you start? You start with the cylinder. You always start with the cylinder. And a cylinder from direct front view looks like a rectangle. So let's just render this basic cylinder, okay? So we're gonna give it a basic base tone, which is like a mid-tone, really basic mid-tone. And then we're going to decide where the light is coming from, which is top down. And I'm gonna diagram all this for you in a second. So the light is coming from top down at a 45 degree angle. If you use soft brush on low opacity pure white, you can layer your brushes and they automatically blend. Your brush strokes automatically blend together. Same with the shadows, low opacity, full black, and we're layering the brush strokes as we shrink the paint. The opacity takes care of the blending, the full black takes care of the feed, and we get an automatically blended cylinder, just like that. Beautiful. So we want two of these, because we have two sets of lips. I mean, we have two lips, um, so we want two of these, because we have two lips. So copy paste, put one right on top of the other or right under the other, however you see it. All right, so now we've got two little lips. And before what you guys saw me do for the front view is at this point, I go into liquify. Do you guys remember that? At this point, I go into liquify and I apply all of the subject changes that turn it back into a basic set of lips but this is three quarter view. Three quarter view means we rotated. So the lips that were once front view are now three quarter view. They're on the side of the face. So the symmetry line moved from being perfectly on either side of the face to being on one side, either left or right, however you rotated it. Okay, so that means something happened to the cylinder. So what happened to the cylinder? We have to go back in time to the prehistoric era where it was just primitive shapes and and they were all gathered around a fire. <laughs> it was primitive shapes, it was a stupid joke. So if this is a front view cylinder, perfectly squared, perfectly set up with the camera, that means that this is a side view cylinder. The cylinder, here, let me draw a perfect, close to perfect uh, oval, all right. This is a cylinder that has been rotated, okay? So this cylinder is revealing its form. This is the z-axis going into the cylinder. This is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. So that means that this three-quarter view cylinder is what we double stack to get a three-quarter view set of lips, right? We've got the sides, we've got the cylinders, we're good, right? The problem is that because we're also front view oriented, because everybody has drawn lips because of some style or other, because of some way they drew, you know, we're inspired to become artists because of a cartoon show, which is honored in and of itself. It's good to honor what inspired us. It's not good to honor what inspired you if it's detrimental to your development and skill development as an artist. So if the styles that inspired you, whatever the shows were when you were young that first made you pick up a pencil and paper, are making you stick to that flat symbolic way of drawing, um, I lost track of the sentence. It's just not good. Don't do it. Um, so what happens is this is what a, let's say, let's very gently, I'm using the word noob and I'm using it with the awareness that I at one point was a noob. This is what noobs do when they want to make a three quarter view lip. Maybe they'll add the little bit of a, of a perspective change. <laughs> Maybe if it's a good day, this is what they do. 
right? This is it. This is it. They flatten the far side. The problem is that none of neither the front view lip or the three quarter view lip factored in the cylinder. I mean, like, what do you think lips are? They're just flat. They kind of just like like that one really, really old character from SpongeBob with like the dried out lips, like it's just flat completely. No, lips do a pucker naturally. They're like cushions. They cushion our food. They protect our teeth. They do so much. And so they cushion out, they stick out. The sticking out, this base shape of that forward projection of lips is the cylinder. So if you study the cylinder in a three quarter view rotation, then even if you never do any more lip studies from reference, if you only do three quarter view or rotated cylinder studies, you'll be able to break down and problem solve your way through without reference. This is the key term without reference, problem solve your way towards a three quarter view lip that's rendered. Art is problem solving, write that back to me. Art is giving yourself a series of problems with your original sketch idea and solving the problems using light and form. So these two sets of lips are these two cylinders which are right now object. They're very objective. They have no subjective definition. They are non, they're not, they don't belong to anything. They don't belong to any object. I mean, they don't belong to any definition. They are just objects, simple, clean cylinders. And if you teach yourself how to render basic objects that belong to nothing in light, you can do anything with them after that. You can paint an arm, all right? You can paint an arm. You can paint a leg. You can paint a fabric fold if you just studied cylinders. There's cylinders in everything. And so you studying cylinders without any reference means that even without reference, you can problem solve your way into finding the core shadows of an arm, a leg, and fabric folds. A cylinder is the mother shape outside after the fact, you know, after you understood what a core shadow is from the sphere, which is like, I would say the God shape. The cylinder is the mother shape. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know what the categorization is. I don't know where the logic is in my categorization. But the cylinder is extremely important for character artists because it's everywhere in organics and materials. And the sphere is extremely important for students who are so new to art, they just bought a tablet yesterday because this one helps them understand the core shadow. So the sphere is the mother shape for form theory and the cylinder is the mother shape for anatomy study. So let's go back into the cylinder. So now that we have this cylinder rotated, right? So right here, let's rotate the, these two cylinders. Let's do that then, merge layers. Okay, so how do we rotate them so they actually look three quarter view? How do we do that? Well, three quarter view rotation isn't just about squishing the lips. That's not the only thing that goes into three quarter view rotation. We have to remember that once we rotated it, that cylinder got a little bump on it. The bumps were revealed. So one thing I wanna do is open up Portrait Studio real quick. I should have opened it beforehand. I'm sorry about that, um, but I'll open it in the background. Um, so this bump of the cylinder, if we were to draw a bunch of contour lines, we can see that there is a bunch of grid lines moving this way. Okay, so maybe I'll do that a little bit better. So we'll draw the most basic, basic cylinder in three quarter view, which is basically these contour lines. Then draw the lips on top. But one half of the lips is wider than the other half. So again, it's not a simple compression Oh, this was mid, you know, front view lips and the Cupid's bow bump was right in the center axis of the symmetry line, right? No, the center axis of the symmetry line moves this way. So if we were to get those same lips and apply through quarter view on them, we can't just make it a perfect bump. Oopsie. We can't just make it a perfect bump. Oh, I did that again. 
All right. So we compressed the lips for three quarter view and then we kept it in the center. Even if we throw it off to one side, it's not enough because we still haven't factored in the cylinder. So there's no shortcut around learning the cylinder. There's no quick fix. There's no liquefy. You just have to give yourself a reminder that there is a cylinder in this rectangle. So if I open up Portrait Studio and I load just the basic shapes, like just the most basic shapes, um, okay, and I rotate it to be perfectly centered with the camera. So all you see is almost a perfect rectangle. And so it's only once we've rotated it does the belly of the cylinder start to stick out. Let me change the background value. Oops. Okay, so once again, perfectly straight on, head on with the camera. It's almost a perfect rectangle. Okay, and the only thing that makes it look cylindrical is because the field of view is, is enabled. So if we rotate it only on the x-axis, we get this little belly to stick out. Nothing is going to do this for you. There's no shortcut that'll make this cylinder appear in your art. You have to yourself remember this. So again, what we do when we want to make a three-quarter view lip is we select only half these two cylinders and we compress it inward. And we remember where that cylinder marker is for the center axis. So this cylinder marker here, we place that here. But we don't place it as a head-on cylinder marker. We place it as the half line of the grid line of the cylinder. Because the Cupid's bow is now, everything is now revealing its belly. Everything is sticking its belly out now. So the brow bone, the cheekbone, the chin are all starting to reveal their outward cylindrical substructure. As soon as we rotated the three-quarter view. So as soon as we rotate a face from front view to three-quarter view, everything starts revealing its thickness. Everything starts revealing its cylindrical shape. So now we do a, a cylindrical imprint for the, the Cupid's bow indentation on the lips. And we do a cylindrical imprint for the outer lip and the lower lip. Sometimes it's more inside for the lower lip if the upper lip is slightly uh, sticking out a little bit more if there's a, a bit of an over, overbite. If you want to do it for either lip, you can, but there, this eventually melts in with the rest of the face. So only on the part that has been rotated. Okay, and so we end up with this sketch that caters to the cylinder. So we have these two corners on either side of the lip, right? You guys remember those from front view? All right, so there's the lips from front view. Very general sketch to help guide us through. These two corners, something happened to the far one. What happened? Let's say that one skinny little boy is standing beside the Baymax character, the, the health companion. What is it called from uh, Big Hero 6? You know, Baymax. All right, so <laughs> a skinny kid is standing behind Baymax. I'm just trying not to say standing behind a fat person. I'm trying not to be rude. Baymax, okay, so the skinny person, we just rotated the stage they were on. We didn't do anything. We have a rotating stage. We just rotated the stage, and we have Baymax right here. Do we see the skinny person anymore? Like, okay, imagine it's like really rotated. No, because the skinny person is now tucked behind Baymax, even if it was just another equally big Baymax. But in this case, it is a skinny person because the little corners are a tiny elf, all right? Let's just say it's a tiny elf so we don't offend anybody. All right. <laughs> okay, so the tiny elf is hiding behind Baymax. We rotated the stage and only the stage. The, the tiny elf ends up being tucked behind Baymax because the rotation is now hiding. This is called stacking. Two objects beside each other. Perfectly, exactly the same shape. We, all we did was rotate the stage they were on or rotate the camera. All of a sudden, one object is behind the other and one object is hiding behind the other. 
This is called stacking and it's continuous. This is perspective. So because we rotated the lips, as so many things collapse that you think you know about how to draw a face, all go through down the, the down the window, all go through the window, down the flusher, what's the term? They all they all just go through, I don't know. So what happens is that because you know how to paint front view, you will fool yourself into thinking you know how to rotate and how to stack. You don't. Rotating and stacking, there's no shortcut around it. There's no accidental way you get good at it. You only get good at rotation and stacking once you study rotation and stacking. There's no supplemental study that'll replace this in your visual library. There's no magic spell. There's no secret five minute video somewhere that'll just teach you how to do it really quickly other than my videos, baby. Um, so what you have to do is study this strictly, strictly study stacking. Go and draw a bunch of spheres on top of each other uh, in different directions, casting shadows on each other in some way or another, draw a cylinder on top of them. Studying stacking only happens, learning stacking only happens by stacking putting objects in front of other objects. And this is why a lot of you fail in three-quarter view because you've never studied this before. You're attempting to reference a flat front view, orthographic view of a flat object, even if you rendered it three-dimensionally, it's still flat in your mind. And you're trying to reference a flat object for a three-dimensional volume. It does not work. So this cylinder of the upper and lower lip have stacked and hid the far corner of the mouth, which up until it rotated was just perfectly symmetrical mirror reflection on either side. Now all of a sudden everything you thought you knew is just gone. You, nothing makes sense anymore. And the artist gets confused. So this is, this is how to do it. Remember the cylinder, study the cylinders. Remember that the cylinder's volume is visible after rotation. And that's it. So what I'm going to do now is because now the first step that I did, the first step I took was I cut the width in half. So I took this half and shrunk it this way. And this part stayed the same length, could be a little width. It stayed the same width, could be a little bit wider. And now that I'm done that, I am going to delete this far side so that I get the, the cylindrical shape on either way. Or I could get that exact same shape I did before without the sketch lines and go into liquify and mold it back towards a three quarter view, which would look something like this. All you have to do is go right here grab the point where they both stack on each other and pinch it in. I'm reducing density. You just pinch it in, that's it. You're practically done. And then you're pulling the lower lip in as well. You don't have to be clean about this because this is all gonna get blended to hell because a well-rendered lip is an over-blended lip. And I'm doing the same thing for the top lip. All I had to do was just pinch the cylinders. The shadows are all still intact. I'm pushing the upper lip out more further than the lower lip, just because that's the kind of lip I want to draw. Sometimes it's level. And then over here, you don't really have to do anything to this side because this side is almost practically almost facing the camera. I'm going to bump in the Cupid's bow and push up the rest. And I'm gonna give us that little bit of a bump for the far lip and kind of pushing in the rest this way. Okay, so we're just pushing it. This, this all happens at the same time. The Cupid's bow bump at the top and the overlap of the two lips happens at the same time. But look at what I've preserved. These two cylinders okay and then this and this get blended away don't worry about them okay and so after that we know that we've got our lines compressed we know the far side the side that's turned away is compressed and less wide 
That's a key factor here. Make sure the far side is less wide than the close-up side. And on top of this liquefied state, you can go ahead and sketch. Sketch what you need if you need that guidance. All right, right under that, I'm going to throw in a big block for the midtone. Oop, that's not a midtone. <clears throat> right, anything really go, works just fine. I'm going to get my blocking brush, and all the brushes I'm using are available on my store. And I'm just blocking in the lip corner here. And I'm making sure this lip corner still feels like it's behind that lip. I'm going to darken the upper lip a little bit more because the lip, the upper lip is usually darker than the lower lip. Not by a lot. It's not a complete value change. I'm going to give us a shadow under the lower lip. I'm going to add a little bit of brightness for the cupid's bow and general upper lip area. I'm going to add a bit of a bigger block on the edge of the lip as it connects back to the face. And I'm going to extend the cylinder of the lower lip back into the face. You guys can already see it. The navigator is happy. The navigator is signaling that this all reads very well because the navigator gives us an auto blend. It's like it blends it before we actually start blending it because it's so zoomed out. It gives us the report on whether or not this reads yet. And now I'm going to start blending and it's going to go by pretty quickly. So I'm just using my smudge brush on low strength and I'm blending away and I'm trying to preserve this little value right here, this little overlap that is left over by those two cylinders that we stacked. It's so easy once you just accept that the cylinder needs to stick out once it's been rotated. Once you satisfy that requirement, then it just stays three-dimensional as long as you remember not to blend it away. I mean, the student can sit there studying forever all the theory they want, but when it's time to blend, all of that goes out the window because a student will mo most likely overblend than underblend. And because just because they think, you know, blending solves all their problems and it really doesn't, blending is still a knowledge of form. Blending is just knowing where there are no edges, so you still have to study the edges. Blending isn't an easy way into making your art look better. And so I'm just blending away all of this stuff with, while preserving the edges. All right. And then I'm going to just get my soft brush and I'm going to start painting in all those extra little cavities here and there. Now the rendering starts. So after that blocked in cylinder, then the liquefy, then the blending, the painting process doesn't feel very organic. But now it's gonna start feeling organic. I'm gonna darken the upper lip. I'm gonna darken pretty much everything since I want a chance to work my way back up into the highlights. And then I'm going to block in new highlights moving up. So the upper Cupid's bow area, the two lip edges right here that catch a bit of light, a little bit of an extra shadow here in definition, and then just continuously making sure I am representing the far edge of that cylinder. And then this is just a bit elongated, so I'm just going to push it over this way. I'm just blending that away. And then now I'm just shaping, I'm getting rid of all those excessive, kind of like uh, super straight n uh, uh, indications of where the cylinder was before while continuously making sure that the lip still feels like I'm showing off the belly of everything. And working my way to the darkest points while also working my way to the lightest points, making sure that far corner is still hiding behind this corner of the lip.
this this belly of the cylinder. And it's okay to be messy because again it all gets blended together and you go back and forth between blocking and blending blocking and blending there is no one finite blending stage and there is no one finite blocking stage things just keep evolving back and forth back and forth until they're done sometimes lips are a little bit darker on just the corner they just have a bit more pigment and then this Cupid's bow also has to show. Flipping the canvas is really good for identifying whether or not you've lost your stacking. And this Cupid's bow needs to be just a little bit more in that also we're showing not just the outer bump of cylinders, but the inward bump of the concave spaces in the face. And then after this, it's all the same stuff as front view lip, the cast shadow, the edges. This little area needs to be more towards that side. The contrast, the highlights, all of that is still the same. It's just the only thing that we've added to your knowledge is a, a new faith and respect for the lip as it rotated for the cylinder and how it's structured basically now I just have to think about the the chin the block of the chin the cast shadow of that entire area down there where jowls go and just blending away I'm not worried about how messy it looks because it doesn't matter what does matter is that I know where my edges need to go and where my edges will go. Is not really, you know, once once you know that you're not blending areas that are going to damage the piece, you don't really get scared. You just blend as much as you need to. Right? As long as these two lips are intact. And then I'm just going to get my soft brush now and again just lowering the strength and working my way towards softer transitions, catching the light in certain areas of the lips at the top, adding more of that light of the upper lip on the upper half of the lips. A little bit of light sometimes sneaks in right above that corner. If you want to show the lips as more of those structured lips, you can give a bit of a bump. It's not so much a smile, it's just how the lips bump up in the top in that corner. You can give it more characterization. Sometimes you do have thinner lips that just don't do this. But once you do have those outlier lips that are extremely thin, you just look up a reference you'll still find that the lips are cylindrical. There's no such thing as non-cylindrical lips. It's anatomically inaccurate. It's impossible because humans, the way that they're structured, the lips wrap around the teeth and they store a lot of fat and muscle. There's no bone or cartilage inside the lip structure itself. And I'm just showing a little bit of light on this side. Maybe there's a little bit of cartilage on the outside of the lip. Sometimes a little bit of light sneaks in under. It's not light, it's pigment that sneaks in under that lip. And then I'm just dropping the values a little bit more so that I can work my way back up towards highlights. So any questions at all that might make this tutorial a little bit more specific for you? So I'm adding a little bit of highlight there. So climbing slowly, I'll flip my canvas to do it. And that's really the secret to drawing lips that look three-dimensional is this missing bump on the lips that really makes them feel like they have been rotated. And then I'm going to give the lips more of a believable, um, more of a believable stack with radial shading. So brush stroke number one, number two, 
number three, number four, and then deleting everything under that line. And then lightening it above that line if you feel like it darkened it too much. So just take a look at that. That's what radial shading does. And why is the lower lip outlined by a lighter block? This one right here, that's just a pigment change. And I wouldn't say it's outlined. I would say that it's, it's just not blended yet. So this isn't really an outline. This is the pigment change. There's no outline here. This all just gets darkened eventually. So this right here, there's no outline out here. This is a this is a bounce light line. So this all goes this way and this all goes this way. So the cylinder is still intact. You keep re-strengthening the presence of the cylinder more and more each time. And then I'm using a bit more radial shading on those two outer lips. So remember, I use very, very prominent features in order to pull off the class. I have to, or else it's hard to showcase the presence of that form on like very, very flat lips or anything like that. So there's a reason I pick these forms um, and these types of lips in my tutorials or these types of noses, etc. So I'm adding a bit of shadow for the rest of the face, for that core shadow that sits on the whole half of the face. The lip is part of the beard shadow, right that back. And so I'm just blending a little bit on the top half and I'm bringing in a bit more highlight after I blend, blend it just because there's a little bit of that light. And depending on where the light is coming from in your reference, it could be through quarter view rotated, but the light is still above the camera at a three quarter view angle. Um, so, you know, you never know, you have to make sure you, you understand where the light is coming from. So I'm painting as if the light rotated as well. And this whole core shadow, I'm going to exaggerate it for a second, this whole core shadow right here is intact. And that's what I'm tracing and preserving in these two cylinders. moving upward back into the cheek. So it's good to have the cheeks available to you and the rest of the face. It's weird painting only a feature. Usually the beard shadow and the nose help me decide what I'm doing with the lips. And I never really render lips so far um, because they're just the lips. They're not part of the focal point in an extreme way. They're just kind of there and they just serve completing the rest of the face. They don't really serve any other purpose. I'm merging it down with the background layer so that the smudging is more true with other values instead of transparent smudging. And now my smudge brush is at 3% and I'm nearing the end and I'm just hovering my smudge brush. I'm barely touching the surface and letting some of those surfaces blend together because an overblended lip is a well-rendered lip. Overblended in the sense, you know, within reason. And I'll just keep flipping the canvas until I have something that's agreeable. A little bit of extra shadow here. Sometimes that shadow traces the lower lip. Sometimes there's an extra little cast shadow down there. But this was all made possible by our friends at Cyl Cylinder. This was all made possible by the cylinders bump that is visible to us from here. And now that I'm done that big stuff, I can go into right into that little corner right here and really, I mean, I'm gonna zoom in for you guys, really exaggerate that bump, that pinch of the two lips under each other. And that does so much for that rendering because that's kind of a little bit of that highlight snuck down into that area. Actually, I don't want to put a shadow there just yet. And it's just under the lips, just there. And the same thing on the other side. Now I'm ready to darken that lip corner, full black, low opacity, 
and I'm working my way towards the fully darkened lip corners. One is more open and visible to the viewer and one is tucked behind the far lip. And again, I'm making sure everything under that edge is deleted away. This was on a new layer. So those two lip corners I just added were on a separate layer. And if you feel like this is all like too much contrast, you can use a whole layer and delete only away at what you truly know will be dark. If it's not dark enough, you can use a darkened layer and delete away only at what you feel like can be truly light. All right, and then now that I'm zoomed all the way, and you can see why I zoom out, there's so many large volumes to keep an eye out for. This is why I stay so zoomed out all the time. And this is why my work looks the way it does. If you've ever seen my process during live streams, I zoom out and I stay zoomed out because it helps me see everything on like a god mode. I get to see whether or not my stacking has been interrupted, whether or not the contrast is crazy, where my core shadows are. All of those things can be appreciated from a zoom out perspective. And of course there's the uh, block of the upper lip that builds up slowly. So block number one, block number two, block number three, and that builds up slowly and you can blend those together. I'm using my smudge brush. Sometimes depending on the light, you know, we can cheat a lot in art and pretend like the light is just there just conveniently. But just very very gently it's not a you know a very uh it's not a crazy cheating that we're doing it's just a little bit of light rule breaking just so it helps us outline some things that may have been lost had it been a photograph and so same thing on the other side with the upper lip the upper lip light blocks are ignored a lot and that's why students panic and end up overusing contrast in certain areas and I'm just blending. This is the rendering stage. Things are just happening together. The, the, all these little areas are all still very intact. And the rotation of that far lip is still intact. May have lost it a little bit. And I'm just letting some of that light sneak down through the cupid's bow. A little bit of a bump in between the two lips. Sometimes there's a bit of a a cut there and the rest is all up to you if you're going to put lipstick on these lips it would just be dark and then there's the cast shadow of one lip on top of the other and that's as simple as doing that on a new layer you can keep it on darken if you don't want to interrupt your contrast and you just have to make sure you delete with a soft brush because cast shadows are blurred and this cast shadow sits just hugging the edge, not exactly on the edge, but just hugging the edge. And then flipping the canvas once again. And then now you can talk about, you know, where you want to keep some of the shimmer of the lips or like some of the, gl uh, the gloss of the lips, where you're going to, you know, what you're going to do with all of that. At that point, that's just all based off the kind of lip you're drawing really. Is it like a glam portrait? Is it something that has a lot of those little uh, glossy bits to it? It just depends on what reference you're using and always, always pick up a reference when you're doing something like that. And I'm gonna get my, my big heavy duty smudger and I'm gonna try to get rid of some of the banding now that I'm zoomed out. And it's just a smudger that kind of does that last little bit of value assessment. And I just brush it literally over everything because it gives me that last bit of insurance that the lip has been properly blended. And even more so, I'm going to push that rotation of the lips just for exemplary purposes. So really pushing it in 
I mean, where it was before was still rotated, but I'm making a fuller lip. Oops. Okay, liquify trying to mess me up. And blending everything together. One more time, increasing it into like extremely large and just using that on all of these areas. And then one more time, I am going to do a last pass. This is the pass I was talking about before where you can darken so that you can move things all in the same direction once again. So deleting only where you truly feel you want some value or lightening where you feel like you have a bit too much shadow. So for me, I'll probably do the lightening for that lower lip and that upper lip because I, I lean more towards, you know, safe contrast. And so I, I do something like this and it helps me make sure that I'm really only keeping contrast where I absolutely need it. And it's just nice because it gives us that little bit of cleanliness, which I like in my work. It's all up to you if you want, you know, more painterly work. I like when there's just very, very selective contrast. Okay, so any questions at all? Go get that big cylinder sponsorship. So this was done very quickly. Of course, you guys will have way more time than I do, less than there are 40 or an hour. Okay, and so really quickly, I wanted to critique these pieces. And we're pretty much doing the exact same thing. We are going into liquify and finding that missing cylindrical indication. So pushing in and pushing out. And so this lip, the reason why it looked so flat before is because you literally just flattened a front view lip. You even still had the front view shape in the far side. And so in order to get lips that actually look three dimensional, we have to see some kind of bump on the cylinders of the lips. Okay, so take a look at that before after again it, it, there are lips that are flatter but it's really up to you and i'm adding the shadows on either edge of the lip and i'm also adding the highlight of the upper half of the lower lip and the shadow of the lower lip cylinder same thing with the upper lip look at that it's messy who cares we're going to smudge that away back into the face. Adding shadow only where we need it. So if this lip had lipstick, you just throw the black right back on top. But you still have a cylindrical shape. For that far corner and then you blend it all together and then this lip we need just a bit of a highlight under the corner there's almost always a highlight under the corner and that's all the hydration of the saliva that hangs out around the corners of the lips but also the lip there is just a bit smoother and so there's a lot of reasons why that corner of the lips has a highlight to it sometimes. And I'm adding a bit more shadow, zooming out, and blending all of that in together with the rest of the face. I'm blending away your shadow under the nose, borrowing one of your highlights, and adding in the highlight of the cupid's bow and sort of blending it with the upper lip and a little bit of a highlight even with the lipstick on of that lower lip okay so really really quick changes but they do something which is 
they add all this new volume to the lips and just give them that little bit of three-dimensional quality, which three-dimensional quality means higher skill. That's how it translates in the world of art. Any additional three-dimensional quality that you invest into your paintings elevates the represented skill. So before, after, and then for this one, it, this one is even more obvious that it's extremely, extremely flat on the far lip. All we got to do again is just grab that and pinch it in and grab this and push it out. And then we're rotating everything away from the camera. So I'm making it symmetrical as well. Grabbing that and pushing it in. So before, after, before, after. Let me zoom in. Just, I didn't repaint this one. This one, I didn't repaint it. All I did was change the presence of the cylinder before, after. So for this one, all I, all I did, all I did was add, here, let me select this, go to before, after, all I did was add this. Oh, this one is in, okay, uh, don't merge. All I did was add the cylinder after it rotated. All right. So before, after. I would repaint some areas, definitely, because we have some shadows where shadows shouldn't be, like the leftover of this lip should be all light. And then we need a nice big block for the corners. And that block gets blended out into almost invisibility with the rest of the face, but it's there when we zoom out. And then this one, exactly the same thing, except we're preserving the edge. And then um, whatever lipstick he had on, I'm also keeping that. And then the full shadow of the lower lip extends all the way out like that, but a little bit less bright, a little bit less dark, so something like that. And then again, blending that into almost invisibility. And a little bit of that pocket shadow that happens under that lower lip. So I'm, I'm doing three paintings in 50 minutes, so I'm sorry if my blending is just a little bit messy. It's a lot. Um, and then finally, there's also the radial shading that hits that inner corner very, very gradually. So full black, low opacity, brush stroke number one, you can barely see it. And then working your way down into the darkest pocket of the overlap of the two lips, deleting away under the lip until you're left with this shadow that recedes that lower lip back into the cavity of the mouth. Okay, and then just because it's feeling a little bit awkward, I'm going to try to just uh, ease up on that line. Once you know what these lips are doing, once you know what lips do, what, when, what form does, it gets really, really hard to ignore the form. So I'm going to try to get the lips to be at the same level and blending away over here. So I'm not sure if this is a male or a female or something in between. Um, so I'm not going to try to do anything about that. But 
Finally, I'm going to finish off with a darkened inner and outer corner. And the darkened inner and outer corners are going to complete the need for the contrast in that area. Always finding a fine balance between contrast and grays. Midtones are everything because they are what set this up so that it can receive the contrast. And so if we take a look at the before and after now, before, after. So one is three-dimensional, one is not. One relies on the symbol, one relies on the form. Before, after, before, after. And if you feel like I darken the lip a bit too much, you can always just raise the value of the lower lip. So if you don't like the look of lipstick, you don't have to lighten the upper lip. You just have to lighten the lower lip because the upper lip is naturally darker. So sometimes lipstick doesn't really change the upper lip tone. I used to work in makeup and lipstick on the upper lip didn't really change the tone, just the hue of the upper lip. But lipstick on the lower lip is really obvious. It's obvious right away. And I'm just adding a bit more shadow. So three different types of instances for what a lip does in three quarter view. Any questions at all? So while with the time I have, I can take this one to a more detailed state and just clean it up a bit. Okay, and then it's really just about taking your time with the final pass for detail. I'm painting at the speed of light and so don't, you know, don't, you don't have to use all the shortcuts that I use. Honestly, now everything makes sense. Great. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. I got five minutes. I'm just uh, picking a final tone for the lips. And always flipping my canvas. Picking a final shape for the lips as well. I feel like this one could be a bit more of a wide Cupid's bow that's a little bit lower. I feel like it matches that lower lip size. And then adding in that shadow of the lips stacked on each other. Adding in that darkness there. And a little bit of highlight. And that nice clean edge right over here where the cast shadow almost merges in. Flipping the canvas. And a little bit of that lower lip shadow sneaks upward. And a little bit of this shadow sneaks upward as well to reveal the lip corner. And that's pretty much how I paint lips. This is the exact way I go about it and I'm just trying to clean up the patches anything left over strengthening the value of that cupid's bow using my blocking brush to my advantage and letting those edges kind of evolve Let's explain the bumps. Uh, please explain the bumps uh, in lower sides. Uh, which bumps are you talking about? Which lower sides? This bump, this is the chin. So it's not really rendered because I'm in a bit of a hurry, but this is just the chin value. So this is the value of the chin. And I just kind of put a big blot there kind of whatever that is, just a little bump there to represent it. Just plopped it in there. And then a little bit of a value for the Cupid's bow. So I'm trying to really make an exaggerated lip here. Usually I don't even detail lips at all. And a little bit of sharpness on that upper area. 
And then with my pencil brush, I'm just adding in those last little bits. And that's why I'm so careful around students using any contrast for those last little touches of black on either side of the lips. And a little area underneath. Sometimes there's texture and a little bump on the upper lip just there, just that catches the light right at the top and only at the top. And sometimes that bump of the cupid's bow is also cleaned up and not really that dark. Sometimes this area of the lip merges with the cupid's bow as if it almost disappears in three quarter view because it's rotated in such a way the cupid's bow highlight merged with the upper highlight of the lip cylinder. And again, if you really, really want to, you can lighten literally everything and a new layer. Lightening everything. And deleting away. I know it's crazy. Deleting away only where you know there is contrast. and deleting only where you know there is shadow of some kind. Lips should not be over rendered or in the way of any kind anyway. So you can get rid of all those secondary midtones and it'll still look okay because they're not supposed to be in the way. There's only just a little bit of contrast expected for the lips. And so I, I'm, in, I'm in between, you know, it really just depends what I feel like doing. And then this is a lip with lipstick on. Uh, sometimes I put that on multiply, actually. A lip with lipstick on, you just darken the whole thing, deleting only away at the outlines of the lips. That's what lipstick means, is that it's just a small drop in pigment for the upper lip and a large drop in pigment for the lower lip. And of course, there is always going to be that glamour stuff, which is those little glimmers that hang out and those glows and those um, sparkles and whatever it is, the gloss, the shine, the little speckles of the glitter on lipstick depending on your style, how glammy your style is. But that's it. Um, any questions? So please explain the bumps between the chin and the lower lip at the sides. Um, between the chin and the lower lip at the sides. So, um, so these right here, these areas, Hello, may the lorms of Xmas be with you. Thank you. Yeah, um, so these are the just the bumps of the lip, like they're just small bumps. Um, it's it's just this particular lip. I wouldn't say these are ex there's shadow here. That's just the leftover. Sometimes there's a bit of bounce light on the lips, by the way, just depending on the angle and the gloss used. And the bounce light strictly, strictly hangs out only in these areas. Add it anywhere else and it looks a little bit weird because you're canceling out some shadows. Remember, this is a very quick set of lips I drew. As long as you remember where that core shadow is and where that cylindrical bump is of the lips, of the corner of the lips, behind the lips. So this little area here, this should be blended out a little bit more. As long as you remember that, you won't be able to ignore that part of the form anymore. And all the lips you draw will look super pro, super three-dimensional. I'm not sure which bumps you meant. Um, Boku? Uh, yeah, I'll need, a, I'll need to see an example. Now I'm just adding a bit of brightness down here. So the more time I get, the, the more clean the transitions will be like this bounce light here needs to be blended out 
and sometimes we have a little bit of shine that sneaks down under the lip and that's again just more of that those angles in between not too much though because you don't want it to be patchy just something that outlines that lower lip we have different types of lips some lips have the white outline there's a little white outline sometimes and it just does that and it breaks all the rules of lips and it's just there and it doesn't care what lighting is so that's just a pigment change that's different types of skin and so that depends on your reference i can add it right now i may i may not you know it just depends on that and I'm just blending away the rest of the lips. Again, an over-blended lip is a well-rendered lip. I'm finding all those overlap edges and I'm almost done. Just cleaning all these edges up. Cleaning this edge up. Making sure that lip always sticks out on that far side. Okay, so what's another tutorial idea that you guys want? Someone had asked me to do clothing and folds. That's definitely coming up. Other tutorials that are coming up is eyebrows, how to texture eyebrows. Does that sound like a good idea to you guys? Um, and then I forget there was one more. Sometimes I blend this little bit where the two lips overlap because that just gives us this really nice loss of detail that seems to promote more volume. It's a very strange little trick. A lot of artists just blend this whole thing out. So it's really up to you. This is something I do in my personal work because the lips are so, um, they're on the bottom of the detail hierarchy. So they should not be overly detailed anyway. And so it's a thing that we can get away with as artists. And I'm making sure that half shadow is still present, just there. And if you want, you can just add more shadow for the lower lip. Um, from anime, maybe Fugaku Uchiha had those. I would have to look it up. I don't have time. Fugaku Uchiha. Um, I would have to look it up. Uh, Can you teach us to blend our problems away? Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sometimes the shadow also likes to kind of leak down, downward. Um, you get away with a lot when it comes to three quarter view lips because of the illusion of outlining that happens when you stack anatomy. So um, there's, there, there's a lot more that goes into what you can get away with and what you can't and all of that. But of course, I'm already out of time. It's six o'clock. Um, but uh, maybe for next time I can get into it when I'm critiquing a set of lips instead of painting one fresh in class. And um, I'm just, I just want to combine it with the surrounding area just so it's not really outlined. And that's it. Thank you guys for coming today. I hope this tutorial helped you. Um, if you guys have any suggestions for tutorials, please feel free to contact me. I have so many different ways you can contact me. Instagram, direct messages, or you can leave a message on the subreddit, or you can leave a message on the Discord. There are so many ways to request critiques. There are so many ways to request different types of tutorials. I really appreciate you guys coming out here for this tutorial. If you guys want to submit your work for critique, you just have to go to istabrak.com and click the subreddit icon right here. Submit your work here to get it critiqued. All the pieces that I picked, I picked from here. Next time I may look at this one, I may, may look at this one. Um, there's so many different pieces that are being submitted nowadays, which is really cool. Next. Thursday, not this Thursday, next Thursday, I'm going to be taking a look at the Ancient Weapon Design Challenge. So look into that, read through it if you're interested. You still have one week, a little bit over a week to join the challenge. You win so much stuff. 
And please don't forget to follow me and subscribe on YouTube because I'm having issues with the algorithm and it's driving me crazy. And follow me on Instagram for memes and tutorials. Okay, thank you guys for coming. Bye.